So hi, everyone. Thanks for attending the panel here. We're going to discuss about uh, investing in exciting neurotech companies that will include devices, implants, neurosteam, as well as diagnostic. Um, basically, uh, will there will be um, tips on how to raise money on this um, sector, uh, how to exit companies. I will discuss the public markets. Um, what are the subsector of interest in the field, and what are more in general the trends uh, in investing in the space um, uh, at the moment? Um, we, I'm uh, Diana Saraceni, general partner of Panacas, and I'm co-chairing this with uh, Jeff. Jeff, do you want to start and introduce yourself? Yes. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jeff Cohn. I'm a uh, research analyst at Ladenburg Thalman. And I look a lot uh, as far as sectors in med tech, cardiac vascular, ortho spine, energy deliveries. And I look at a lot of uh, external and internal stimulation related to uh, neuro amongst the other portions of the skeletal and uh, vascular systems and nervous systems. So um, it's nice to be here and thank you all for joining us. I guess. Um, Deanna, we're going to go around the table, if you will. I guess we have four speakers with us. We've got uh, Aswin Gunaskar from Zito, Gar Smith, Business Development at Ontario Brain Institute, Jeffrey Klass from uh, Sense Neurodiagnostics, as well as Yadir Yagubi from uh, Pathmaker Neurosystem. I'm sorry if I uh, didn't pronounce last names appropriately, but... Uh, Perhaps we could go around for a few minutes and everyone could introduce themselves in that order, starting with you, Aswin. Yeah, sure. I'm Aswin Gunachekar, uh, founder and CEO at Zeto. Um, uh, at Zeto, we are making uh, the EEG experience uh, uh, easier uh, and uh, more accessible to healthcare facilities. Uh, as you, most of you would probably know, uh, it's, it's uh, currently EEG, it requires a whole bunch of effort, uh, you know, a trained operator to administer the test and uh, also uh, other kinds of resources and time uh, because of uh, the stagnant technology. Uh, what we are doing is we're making uh, uh, EG accessible in the form of a wearable helmet, um, uh, no goop, no preparation of the skin. Uh, information is uploaded to the cloud instantly and a neurologist can read it from anywhere. So you're we are able to make EEG accessible to any healthcare facility that do not have uh, an EEG operator or a neurologist on call. Um, uh, Jeff, what else would you like me to, um, uh, is, that, is that a good enough intro? Or uh, is there any other things that you'd like us to cover? Maybe helpful for the rest of the speakers as well. I think that's fantastic. So, um, Garth? Oh, hi, my name is Gar Smith. I'm VP for Business Development uh, and Partnerships at the Ontario Brain Institute. We're based in Toronto, Canada. Um, you know, the goal for Ontario Brain Institute is to, you know, leverage all of that great neuroscience research that goes on around the world to have actually pa patient-oriented impact. Um, we have a large research team, a large research network of 300 um, researchers across Canada, some in the U.S., um, you know, our goal is to really dive deep into the deep phenotyping exercise necessary for a lot of the neurological indications. Uh, one of the things that we do is we, as a consequence of our funding or as a, as a benefit of our funding, we put all the data that is, um, that is uh, acquired from uh, these research institutes in one spot, the informatics platform called BrainCode. And obviously BrainCode is there for this um, you know, interrogation of the data for, you know, outside of uh, where the data producers are. Um, we find that as a, a team neuroscience is the way to go in terms of a lot of the neurologic indications. I think we need to know a lot more about neurologic indications before we start thinking about interventions. The team that I lead is in the commercialization side. So uh, we just launched um, a national neurotech pitch competition called NERVE. This is what happens when you get neuroscientists doing um, branding and marketing. Um, and so uh, that is a Canada-wide initiative where we fund uh, small uh, startups in the neurotech space. And we also run a, a investment fund of sorts uh, called NERD, 
Um, and uh, we are, you know, if uh, the Jeffs and the Dianas of the world are interested in a company and they said, you know, gosh, we need some, they need some work before they become really uh, suitable for us to have a discussion with. Our investment um, is, is, is to do those product development milestones to allow these companies to have uh, better conversations with um, uh, private investors. Uh, to date, we've uh, invested in over 90 companies in the nerd tech space, and we're starting to actually see some returns. So excited to uh, be part of this group and to talk about neurostimulation and where it fits into our world. Thank you, Gareth. Um, maybe uh, Jeff, Jeff, do you want to go next? Sure. I'm Jeff Class, CEO at Sense Neurodiagnostics. And we have technology to detect, measure, and monitor neurological disease of the brain. And we do so in real time, non-invasively. Our initial focus for the tech is on stroke and traumatic brain injury. And we're currently developing three devices using that exact same technology. Uh, one device for use in the neuro ICU to monitor those patients which are susceptible to expanded brain bleeds. Second device to be used in emergency medicine, both in the ED and with ambulances. And that will triage patients by determining if they are having a stroke, but more importantly, by stroke subtype. So we'll be able to see LVO versus non-LVO versus bleed. Uh, and then the third device that we're making, we've contracted with the US Department of Defense for a device to detect traumatic brain injury and then to monitor that individual's condition when they're medevaced into a field hospital. Um, like I said, we're RF-based uh, technology. Uh, everything we do is done so in real time. It takes only two and a half seconds for us to uh, have on 360 data points of the entire cranial vault to really determine exactly what's going on. So we're lightning fast. Uh, to date, we've had a, a million and a half in grants from mostly the National Science Foundation. We have a contract for $2.3 million with the U.S. Department of Defense for the military application. And then we've raised in our seed round a million two and our current B round, which is open, we've raised seven and a half million so far with uh, nine and a half remaining to go. Some of that is which is in due diligence. So that's Sense Diagnostics. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, Nader, do you want to go next? Great. Thank you, Diana. Uh, I'm Nader Yagubi, and I'm a co-founder and CEO of Pathmaker Neurosystems. Pathmaker is a near commercial stage neuromodulation company based in Boston and Paris. And we're focused on developing breakthrough non-invasive systems for the treatment of serious neurological disorders. Our technology platform is based on neuronal hyperexcitability suppression which we accomplish non-invasively using multi-site neurostimulation, where we stimulate at spinal and peripheral sites in a manner that actually modulates the spinal pathways. We're initially focused on post-stroke spasticity and ALS uh, for our uh, first product, Myoregulator, which treats spasticity. Uh, the device has been designated by FDA as a breakthrough medical device. We've now completed two clinical trials actually for our myoregulator device in spasticity and we have positive readouts. We just announced today the start of our US multi-center PIPL trial, which is supported by a $5 million grant from NINDS under the NINS Create Devices um, program. And overall, uh, we've raised uh, over 9 million to date, mostly non-dilutive, we're now actually working on uh, equity financing for commercial launch of our product next year. And this is a $20 million equity financing um, that we're actively working on. So delighted to be here. Thank you so much. And um, I'll go last. Um, I'm uh, Diana Saraceni. I'm general partner and co-founder at Panacas. We are a venture capital firm investing in uh, private companies mostly. Um, uh, any stage from, from seed to pre-IPO round, any ticket size from half a million to um, 2025. Uh, primarily, we invest um, out of Europe, but we have a location, 20% uh, of location to invest um, outside of Europe. 
Um, we just raised a new fund of 160 uh, million euro, and this is all to be invested. We are uh, focused on uh, medical devices, um, but we also invest in uh, therapeutics now with this new fund. And a newer attack, uh, as we did with the first fund, is likely to be uh, an interesting portion, to become an interesting portion of our future portfolio. Uh, with the first fund, we have three investments in the space. Uh, and have a particularly a particular good understanding of uh, newer steam and where where the trends uh, are at the moment. Think we have at least. So um, this is um, this is in a nutshell about Panacas and about myself. I have over twenty years of experience investing in startup companies, um, mainly in Europe, but also in the US and in Israel. So um, maybe we can uh, kick off with um, with a, a, a sort of an open and, and broad question. Uh, it's it's going to be about what you think is are the most interesting areas and the more the more interesting new indication uh, associated with maybe also the more uh, traditional one, the one that have, where products have been on the market for um, decades now. Uh, what do you think are the most the most interesting indication and um, where please I mean support this with uh, with the evidence that's been produced um, by your companies or uh, in 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 similar field what do you have seen as being new and and exciting in the space? Maybe uh, Garth, you want to take oh. a question to start. Absolutely. So um, I'm just going to tell you what we see up here in Canada. And, uh, you know, obviously these are, you know, standard uh, indications. I'm glad we added addiction to the list because, you know, we've seen some really interesting um, um, effects with um, uh, transcranial uh, T uh, TDCS in terms of addiction um, that actually works. So I, I think that the basis for my conversation and my statements that are going to be in this in this group is, you know, the OBI really, we hang our hat on clinically validated neurotech. That's where we, that's where we, that's where we hang out. Uh, we have a, we have a, we've built a network that it helps out with this clinical validation piece. And our investment thesis is that, you know, uh, if you show that your device or your widget is clinically validated and not using literature to, to say that your widget does what it says, the investment community will, you know, will, will follow. I'm not entirely sure we've solved, we've uh, shown that thesis, but you know that's our thesis. So when I look at these indications, you know obviously epilepsy is the one that everybody sees with closed loop uh, systems, and you know we've seen that promise, but you know the the highly invasive uh, technologies, the scaling of those seems to be in, to be an issue. Back pain is coming along. I've never seen so many technologies right now for for back pain, um, and it's all uh minimally invasive uh, uh things and non-invasive like what matters doing so um you know i think that there are some interesting opportunities um the thing that we see that has been unbelievable and again i keep raising this i don't know why i do this but you know in depression mental health the ability for people to have um personalized intervention for their version of their mental health struggles is is the thing that we see as being um quite uh disruptive especially you know with this ongoing psychedelic space you know the the you, you're going to need some sort of mental health intervention um and we've we're starting to see it now in conjunction with this pharma um uh, opportunity and that combination between the stuff that you see in the clinics versus what people can do at home and the combination of those two is a common theme that we see as the, as as pretty exciting moving in the future. Yeah, we'll come to the, the home use uh, later on in in the question. It's very it's very interesting um, when it comes to compliance and and alike. We'll we'll come to that. We'll discuss this later. Nader, do you have any any view on on the yeah, topic? Yeah, sure, sure. I appreciate those comments from Garth. Um, uh, here at Pathmaker, you know, we are primarily interested in indications that are linked to dysfunction of spinal motor neurons and spinal pathways. 
and furthermore, which are indications that are currently being uh, primarily treated with expensive pharmacological agents, and furthermore, are ones that are not yet addressed by neuromodulation. So that's kind of where our interest is. And two examples of this are spasticity and ALS. And you might wonder what the link is. And the link between these two disorders is actually spinal motor neuron hyperexcitability. And this refers to uh, situations where you have the spinal motor neurons uh, depolarizing easily and, being, and firing excessively. And in the case of spasticity, it leads to muscle contraction. And in the case of ALS, it leads to actually the motor neurons dying. So in the case of spasticity, um, which occurs in stroke, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, um, we have a situation that it's currently being treated with um, oral medications such as baclofen and tizanidine. These have been around since the 70s. It's treated with surgery, which is irreversible, where you're cutting either the nerve or the tendon, or it's being treated uh, with an implantable pump, or most, most often these days, it's actually botulinum neurotoxin injection. So uh, we're addressing really the, the very limited treatment options that these patients have. And what we're doing is we're, we're doing 20-minute treatment sessions with our proprietary device in order to reduce spasticity. And in two clinical trials to date, um, which includes our EU pivotal trial, which we'll be presenting later this year, we've shown that the stimulation actually reduces spasticity and improves motor function. But we're also focused on, on molecular mechanisms. And we've actually, actually identified specific neuronal transporters that are modulated by our proprietary stimulation. And I'll mention NKCC1, which is a sodium potassium chloride co-transporter found on spinal motor neurons, which is involved in maintaining intracellular chloride concentration. And we've seen in multiple disease models that NKCC1 after injury is elevated, and that results in high intracellular chloride, which leads to hyperexcitability. And what we've interestingly found is that after treatment with our technology, we could actually reduce levels of NKCC1 protein leading to reduced and normalized chloride, reducing hyperexcitability and reducing spasticity. So uh, we, I think getting to molecular mechanisms of how these neuromodulation technology work is important. In the case of ALS, uh, what, we've, what, we, uh, what we've seen emerge over the last decade is that ALS um, uh, is, has motor neuron hyperexcitability as a fundamental part of the disease. This leads to motor neuron death and inability to control muscles. So currently there's only three FDA approved treatments and these really do not do anything in terms of improving outcomes or survival for these patients. So we have our neuronal hyperexcitability suppression technology that has the potential not only to address ALS symptomatically, but it has the potential to slow disease progression by keeping the motor neurons alive longer. And in the gold standard ALS models, we've been able to show improved motor function, increased survival, increased motor neuron counts. And we've also been able to show uh, uh, changes in HSP70 and SOD1. So we think th these are some interesting areas to apply neuromodulation, but beyond these, I'll just mention that uh, we find interesting the application of neuromodulation to inflammatory disorders because vagus nerve pathways are actually very interesting as they're being deciphered. So uh, I, I, I think there's gonna be some interesting things there. And we also think that the uh, common links to Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and ALS where there is pathological protein aggregation is going to be susceptible, we, we believe, to neuromodulation interventions. Thank you. More on the, more on the diagnostic side, the diagnostic and monitoring, let's say, um, side. Um, that's uh, any any trend, any anything we're you're seeing on the market. Um, probably that's I'm um, going to start with Aswin. Yes. Um, yeah, I think so. Just to give uh, you know, started off with you know our commercialization efforts and what we have uh, seen uh, with our customers. 
So we went commercial in 2020, you know, just when COVID hit. And uh, just in about 15 months, we've crossed about, you know, uh, 5 million in annual sales last year. So the growth has been tremendous for us. And primarily, and also um, as another testament in, for, for the neurospace, we won the UCSF Health Hub Award uh, in uh, hospital diagnostics, um, you know, beating out about 126 companies in the commercial stage. What it really shows is, uh, uh, in a way, I see it as a testament to the neurospace, or especially for devices. Um, it, it's, it's starting to uh, take center stage, and it's, it's only going to be very, very exciting for the future. So I'll start off with that. When we, when we see monitoring for EEG, one of the, uh, one of the main limitations uh, that we've uh, pleasantly discovered has been once you have a product and platform which is accessible, for monitoring something as basic as uh, EEG, which is akin to EKG to the brain. Um, a lot of customers who have been waiting for a solution come to the forefront. And some of the things I can piggyback off of um, uh, or the other speakers here are basically, uh, for example, uh, ICU monitoring, you know, severe stroke, uh, uh, severe traumatic brain injury, uh, sepsis, major cardiovascular procedures, you know, heart failure, all these patients are now in the ICU not being monitored for a lack of a better solution. And we're talking about two and a half to three million cases that are just completely going unmonitored. And the most severe ones, they're calling in and, uh, you know, a human operator to come in late night or, you know, hook the patient up. But that's like less than the 1% that actually get monitored. The vast majority are not being monitored, but as a result, the missing, uh, uh, you know, uh, changing treatment or you know being on top of uh, the condition. That's one thing I see monitoring. The second is you know being able to offer uh, a diagnostic test. Uh, folks spoke about um, you know uh, pharma and psychedelics. You know, think about decentralized distributed pharma clinical trials in the neurospace. For us, what we're seeing is we're starting to be kind of the little door that opens up for being a monitoring solution for distributed decentralized clinical trials because you don't have the effort. You just put the helmet on and uh, you know things are coming through the cloud. So it's, it's, a, it's an information gateway now. Uh, similarly, for psychedelics, you know, these folks are coming in, but they want to be able to quantify their approach. Um, uh, there is a lot of, oh, I, I know it works, but you know, how does the FDA get you through to a regulatory pathway? You need to be able to quantify it. So we're seeing a culmination of non-standard, uh, I would say, industries converge. Uh, and uh, you know, they're looking at you know, something like EEG being a, a good biomarker or you know, even if defining their protocol uh, for studies and being able to get to uh, quantifiable outcomes. So that has been absolutely fantastic for us. So we can see the future evolving very nicely. We see a future where EEG is going to become diagnostic and predictive, not just be a monitoring solution where a doctor reads pages and pages of brainwave traces. It's going to go away, just much like EKG did, you know, uh, with patches and uh, arrhythmia detection and whatnot. So it's it's starting to come along, and with devices like for us, one of the most exciting spaces is uh, magnetic stimulation in non-invasive. Uh, EEG can be a biomarker before and after, so you can actually personalize the. PMS treatment. Uh, uh, two other conditions are just like sense. Stroke is, is, is an absolutely phenomenal condition where multiple technologies can help. Uh, you know, asymmetry in uh, brain waves can be a good indicator of stroke compared to the baseline. Uh, and autism spectral disorder. Uh, there are so many good studies where, you know, um, you know, from children, from, from infants as, as young as five to six months old, you can start looking at the entropy of the networks being formed to be a biomarker uh, or an indicator of autism spectral disorder, six months, nine months, 12 months old. So it's really exciting. And you know, we are being just happy to enable those researchers with a better uh, device, with a better platform and easy to analyze analytics and stuff on the cloud. Uh, so opening the doors and gateways for a better future. So uh, just tremendously exciting. Uh,
Thank you, Aswin. And, and, and Jeff, your, your point of view on sure. monitoring and diagnostic. In this yeah, case. absolutely. So, you know, we're, we're starting out with stroke and traumatic brain injury and, and certainly working monitoring in the ICU, as Aswin just brought up. Brought up. Um, you know, that's very critical because it's all very subjective. You know, we're going to be monitoring individuals and alarming at a moment's notice if, in fact, that bleed's expanding. But um, where we're really going to be going after uh, stroke and traumatic brain injury, we've had a number of oncologists who've uh, been meeting with us. And where they're trying to get us to go and what we see to be a very exciting opportunity is uh, in the oncology space to be able to create a device which is going to be able to detect the early presence of metastatic cancer cells that have passed through the blood-brain barrier for those individuals that are being treated for metastatic cancer elsewhere in the body. So right now, if somebody does have lung cancer, you're not gonna be able to go and get an MRI of the brain just because they have metastatic lung cancer. With a device such as ours, which can be used in a doctor's office, put that on the patient's head and immediately be able to determine if in fact, those metastatic cancer cells have, have um, you know, become present in, in the patient's brain. So that's, that's really exciting new technologies that, we, um, that we're gonna be going to um, you know, shortly. And then after that, uh, another interesting application of what we can do is in sudden cardiac arrest. Certainly you have CPR and you have defibrillators and all that, which are all focused on restarting the heart. But ultimately what you're trying to do is make sure that the brain is remaining viable. So are you pushing enough blood back into that individual's brain in order to keep the brain viable? That's where we come in. So we'll be able to determine the health of the brain during that point in time, because we're able to read any electrical changes that are happening at the time uh, the patient is going through this event. And then after that, Again, all neurological disorders. Um, we've talked to um, a lot of MS research into doctors, and you know they just feel that our ability to offer an ongoing monitoring device for an MS patient to be able to read those lesions and know if, in fact, there is an expansion of demyelination, and be able to have this device at home that they could put on, and it transmits into their neurologist on a weekly basis you know, exactly what's been going on, um, you know, with their condition so that, you know, now the neurologist can react much, much quicker to any changes that that patient's experiencing. Right now they get an MRI once a year with gadolidium. Gadolidium's toxic, stays in the brain. Um, being able to have a take-home device, which is going to be able to monitor them on a regular basis. It's exciting, you know, the, the things that we're going to be able to do with the technology that we have is, is really just, it's, it gets to be kind of endless um, because we're looking for those abnormalities within the, within the cell structure of the brain. And, uh, you know, our technology has proven very effective in being able to do that. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna jump in with the next question. So, and it looks like um, no one here is, involved with implantables thus far, aside from Garth. So I'm gonna throw it at you to start about, uh, as I say, internal and external and comments on uh, trends and what you're seeing as far as uh, internal versus external implantable, et cetera. Yeah, um, so um, I noticed that, that I was, uh, I, I, we, we, we have lots of non-invasive uh, people on this panel. So we think it's gonna be a combo, right? So, you know, you know, again, the way we view a lot of the neurologic in indications, it's a spectrum of diseases, right? It's a, it's Alzheimer's, you know, autism folks figured this out a long time ago. You know, I think as the um, invasive implantable approach trudges along and, you know, the deep brain stimulation has a very specific patient population where, where it helps and a lot of it doesn't. Um, you know, I think that there's opportunities for you to learn a lot more about these different flavors of these diseases through the diagnostic headset, like a EEG or, um, you know, all kinds of other wearable type opportunities. Again, as long as it's clinically validated, the, the combination of the non-invasive versus the invasive, I think has to meet in the middle somewhere. And I think the opportunity that folks like Jeff bring to the table where you're collecting vast amounts of data on these people, 
um, in order to figure out these different flavors is really, really important. Um, you know, if the implantable can get to the point where, you know, it's actually, you know, in a very particular patient group, then that's what has to happen. But again, you know, I think that the scalability of the non-invasive techniques is, is undeniable. Um, and you need to be able to, you know, really show that, you know, what your widget does, it, it says it does. Uh, Nader took me back to my, you know, undergrad PhD days talking about transporters and chloride uh, levels inside uh, inside neurons. That's, that's, that's the level you need to do. You need to do the science behind these um, non-invasive uh, techniques. Uh, I think it's a combination of the two. You know, I think that, you know, again, we really believe that if you do the science and you show that your widget does it better than everybody else and all the consumer stuff is just, you know, arm waving and we feel that the investment community is going to come come to it. But if the invasive way shows for a very particular patient group that they can also uh, impact their lives, then you can't ignore it. So that's where we think it's going to happen. It's a combination of the two. And I think they're going to meet in the middle where the non-invasive informs the, uh, the invasive. They're going to figure out the patient groups, the, pa the specific patient populations that they help. And then we're just going to go through a combination of, 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 of these types of techniques. Got it. And Jeff, Nader, or Aswin, any uh, uh, disagreeing opinion with what Garth had to say on implantables versus explants? Well, I'll just comment on that. I, I, I do agree with Garth that uh, this really, uh, it will be a combination of both non-invasive and invasive. I mean, it really depends on the application. And in some uh, situations, you, you need to very precisely target a very specific location or a specific nerve or group of neurons that you just can't do non-invasively. And for those applications, you're going to have to do um, uh, implantable. But you know, for, as far as uh, uh, we're concerned at Pathmaker, we've been trying to develop our technology to really uh, have the advantages of non-invasive. Because uh, you know, fact of the matter is, uh, an implantable device uh, is uh, it requires some complexity in terms of just the materials used, form factor, size, power. There's a lot of variables there. Uh, there's safety issues, of course, with uh, implanting anything surgically, and by doing it non-invasively, we can avoid the, those issues. We don't have to worry about electrode positioning, drifting, any fouling of electrodes. And one item that I'll also uh, just a final one I'll add is the business model. Uh, with implantable devices, it's pretty much you know buy the device and that's it. With with what we're doing, uh, our business model is really based on recurring revenue from the use of single use electrodes. So I think that opens up uh, a different model. Okay, perfect. I see a hand up, Gore. Yeah, sorry. So uh, just wanted to c confirm what uh, Nader said. I completely agree. Um, I forgot to mention this part of my, my, my statement is that, you know, we asked a lot, a lot of the things that we do, especially when we go into the community, we, we ask the patients what they want. It's amazing. It's amazing. A lot of people build a lot of devices and not really talk to the patients first. So when we speak to them, especially in the epilepsy group, what was really interesting to us was that you know, surgery was underutilized uh, as a as a surgical as a uh, epilepsy intervention. Um, even if it was a cure, the possibility of a cure was high. There was a component of people that didn't really want to do surgery, uh, especially to, if it cured their epilepsy. They'd rather not have the surgery, which was a eye opening experience for us. Some people did, some people didn't, and I think this lends itself to that. You know this is going to be an education piece for the invasive side in terms of like Nader says, it's a, it's a pretty big deal. So it's, that was our experience. That was our experience. And that's why I think the combination is going to be the way to go. Yeah, and, I, and I've seen just to quickly add, you know, invasive could be as, as simple as subcutaneous little implants as well, which, which can be done in an outpatient surgery. Things of those nature, you know, especially for refractory conditions, patients kind of embrace that and, and, and very nicely put as well. 
you know, you need to start thinking about, you know, who's going to prescribe this, who's going to do these surgeries, because those can stall before it reaches the patient. Um, and you need to talk to the patients as well. So it's a combination of all of these, not just not just science done in a, in a lab, um, you know, um, that, that can definitely bring cure to patients, value to patients, faster, sooner, better, yeah. Thank you, Dana, sorry. Oh, thank you. A very interesting discussion. I'm going to uh, switch to um, to to uh, and, and ask Jeff, who's um, Jeff Cohen this time, who's uh, so exposed to public market and, and following closely uh, market condition. Um, I'm going to ask you a more general uh, open, a more general question on how do you uh, do you see investors uh, in public equity being in, interested in, in the space that's in general? And then obviously um, uh, I can't um, refrain from asking you what the, the markets, uh, how the markets are reacting to these very unfavorable um, general uh, conditions. And if you think, uh, what do you think the, 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 the is, 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 going to happen in, in, in the coming weeks. Uh, I know <laughs> it's, uh, it's a lot to ask, but uh, a comment. Upcoming months or years. So uh, I, I guess I have a few comments. So I, obviously everything's been in some massive flux recently and also throughout COVID. The, um, the, the IPO market and valuations have been uh, very robust and very much increased initially, I'm not including the last three months. And then what we saw is we saw a, uh, a tsunami of SPACs, if you will, which, uh, which suddenly peppered up valuations with companies that had some uh, theoretical fantastic idea that uh, was garnering uh, you know, a billion plus valuations. And my disclosure is we do cover three SPACs currently. So, um, I would generally say that the, uh, the, the trends more recently have turned around. Most SPACs, I believe the statistics are 60 or 70% or are down 30 plus percent since filing. And what we've seen is uh, the types of investors in SPACs have also changed from uh, long-term fundamental investors to uh, short-term more uh, structured folks. We've also seen the... Uh, the, uh, the redemption numbers uh, skyrocketing. Uh, initially, we saw some SPACs with redemptions, and I would refer to that as money fleeing the table uh, of 10 or 20 or 30%. And uh, some recently have been, the majority of committed money has gone away. So then the SPAC is left with uh, not the balance sheet that they were estimating. So they were planning on, receiving the SPAC funds plus a pipe or whatever funds they had and having a, a runway. And that's changed dramatically. So um, we've also seen some pushback from the SPAC folks who have argued that uh, it's no faster and easier than an IPO. So, uh, you know, perhaps the old school traditional six to nine month pathway of an IPO may be better served than a SPAC because the, uh, the, the sponsor may be telling you something different than what reality will be uh, playing out. And I, I see Garth laughing my whole way through. So, uh, so obviously he's seen some of that as well, but those are my, my general thoughts. Evaluation wise, we still look at things as, uh, we still look at MedTech as a multiple revenue out two or three years. So that hasn't changed much, although multiples have gone from five, 10, 15, 20 times to uh, three, four, five, eight times, more generally speaking. So I'm gonna um, stop there and kind of throw that back out at you. Actually, Dan, I'm gonna throw at you uh, what kind of appetite you're seeing because you, you see more of this earlier than we do as we generally write research on publicly traded companies. So what are you seeing as far as early and preclinical deals and companies in this space specifically and the amount of data that you're seeing from uh, from human or animal data as well. Yeah, well, what we're interested in are all the um, all the indication where there is a, a significant severity of uh, of the indication itself, because 
I was following the discussion implantable towards uh, non-implantable. We tend to um, uh, um, find out, I mean, we found out uh, that um, uh, e e e implantable, or as you mentioned, all requires a certain commitment from the patient and that goes with the severity of the disease. Uh, while non-implantable also requires a strong commitment from the patient because that has to translate in compliance. And that also goes with the severity of the disease. So both require severity of the disease. Uh, whatever has been uh, tried with non with diseases that are um, kind of mild, clinically speaking, ended up uh, by being either non-implanted or having patients that are non-compliant. But I think, I mean, I think the list of very severe indications where a neurosteam can make a big, a big difference are um, is, is, is still quite uh, interesting. Um, and there's a lot of uh, new, new approaches um, coming uh, into the market. And so we, that's, that's where we're very interested. Um, we, uh, don't nest only rely on um, the um, uh, patentability of, um, I'm going to touch on another topic, is that this space is also very, very crowded uh, from a patent standpoint. So something that we normally uh, look at and check immediately when we talk to companies and run due diligence is um, not only the patentability of um, the new product, but uh, especially the freedom to operate. And that is a nightmare here in this space. It's really, really difficult um, in your esteem in general. The, then we always take, um, consider that even if we're, we feel okay with the state of the art, there will be a certain need of big budgets for the future of the company to defend the position because it's not going to be easy anyway. So that's that's what we like. Severe disease has been addressed um, at, at, on, on, on one end and um, uh, clear uh, patent 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 uh, space. That's these are the two prerequisites in, the, in this in this particular space. And then on this stage, frankly, we also go very very early if we believe the reason to believe that there will be efficacy, safety and efficacy, but efficacy especially in, in case of neurosteam. So maybe we, we can, uh, we're, since we're heading to the end, Jeff, we can just ask one question, uh, one minute for each of the panelists um, to spend one minute and give tips to other entrepreneurs, uh, assuming there, will, there are on the audience. Um, on what is the best recommendation, what is the best um, uh, way to raise capital in the space, if there is anything specific that they want to share. Feel free to jump in and take the yeah. one minute with the best tips. Yeah. Go okay. ahead, Garth. Uh, like I'd let Jeff go first. No, of course. Yeah, so, um, you know, we're running a startup here and, and raising capital is my... 99% of the day job. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's very difficult. Not, it's not, uh, it's not an easy world. Uh, where we've had most of our success has not been in VCs. VCs have been very difficult to, uh, to even get their attention. I know you're bombarded with, you know, hundreds of deals on a, on a regular basis and trying to sort through who might be a worthy bet is, must be a bit of a challenge. Um, so what we've done, you know, we've, we've broadened our market, um, and we've gone into Canada. We've been very successful in Canada, um, uh, particularly seeking investment from angel investors. Um, that's been very robust for us. And that's pretty much how we've been able to fund the company to this point in time. Uh, and then the same in India. So, and what we've done, though, is we've taken our business. We're doing our clinical trials in Canada. Now we're doing clinical trials in India. Um, and, you know, with that comes investment. So if you do get creative and you get out there and, and uh, you know, show interest in, in other countries, it does give you access to, you know, some funding opportunities. So um, that's, that's really where we go. I, I really am interested in getting, 
you know, a strategic relationship uh, and investment within the company as we get closer to commercialization. Some of the larger um, strategics talk to us on a regular basis, but they hold back. They want to know that you're FDA approved, so that's not happening. And I get a lot of that from the VCs too. It's it's well, you're not FDA yet, so you know. Um, but trying to find somebody who wants to take that that pre-commercial risk, you know, is is difficult, and uh, it's not going to come in big chunks. It's going to come in small. So uh, you have to be very tenacious and and uh, you know get ready for a lot of no's or a lot of calls that never get answered. But you just keep going, and uh, if you do, you'll be successful. Just uh, keep with it. Thank you, uh, Nader. Do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. I, I definitely agree with many of the comments that Jeff said. I mean, he's been living it just like uh, the rest of us have. And I would say that uh, for for medical devices, neuromodulation, there's significant non-dilutive funding uh, from government uh, agencies, from foundations uh, that makes sense really to go after. NIH is a big supporter of this. We've actually, with Pathmaker, we've set up a European subsidiary as well to qualify us to go after European opportunities. And there are other advantages that accrue, uh, for example, R&D tax credits. Um, there, there are ways that that could be beneficial uh, for clinical trials that we're running in Europe. Uh, so I, I, I think you, you have to, as Jeff said, you have to be tenacious and uh, leverage the assets you have with non-dilutive. It brings validation. You have to bring aboard uh, uh, in, uh, partners from the clinical world. And, you know, we're working with uh, the Paris Brain Institute and we're working with Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital. These are some of the preeminent institutions in their fields and in their countries. So I think those things all build up. And as, as again, Jeff said, if you keep at it, you will get attention from the larger strategics and the VCs will eventually uh, want to participate because they realize you're at the brink of revenues with a very novel product. So, um, you know, those would be my comments. Thank you. Aswin, from your fundraising experience? Yeah, I pretty much kind of lived through the, the, the same um, um, lessons. Uh, you know, very early stage, concept stage. Um, uh, yeah, uh, the VCs are going to just engage uh, in talks and stuff, but um, you know, not much money is gonna come there. So you're really reliant on angel investing and non-dilutive funding. So um, I think it's really a game of uh, uh, risk mitigation or risk removal, because even if you go to uh, any experienced angel group, they're really looking at, hey, are you being really straightforward with what's the next big risk and how articulate and clear you are about taking that one out, right? Don't think too much and don't don't go and say, hey, I'm the next billion dollar company because they hear that everywhere, right? Like, are you practical? Are you grounded as a founder in telling them truly, this is this is my assessment and, and this is this is how I'm gonna take it out with, with your half a million or one million that you're gonna give me. So that really inspires confidence. And again, it, it's, it's, it's chipping away, it's execution because in a way it's also internal. Uh, fundraising is not just, you know, raising money, right? Like chip away, motivate your team, that gets small steps up and then you go back and raise little by little by little. It is, it is a, yeah, I would say it's a 150% job for the CEO because you're literally, you know, you're getting some food home, you're cooking something and then you're going back out. And, and so it's, it, there's not much room for error. Uh, it does get a little better when, you know, we're closer to the FDA approval for devices. You know, for us, we brought in, uh, you know, uh, smaller VCs after our FDA clearance. So things change. And after that, you get newer, newer burdens to, to fulfill, like commercial or you know, uh, uh, efficacy uh, uh, approvals and stuff. But uh, you know, again, uh, persistence and be very realistic. Be very, very straightforward with yourself about those risks, and uh, stay away from things that really you cannot control as to big, big things which are going to be completely new reimbursement pathways. Uh, chop it down to things that you can actually. Uh, land, uh, you know, like a good beachhead where you can land and and show quick learnings and returns. Investors like that. 
Thank you, Gareth. You you have less of a direct experience with uh, raising. It's quite the opposite. <laughs> but uh, you have a, a recommendation in less than one minute because we run out yeah. of time. So this is the space we live in, right? This is where we. This is what we fund. We fund companies that are trying to get their first big check uh, with um, you know private pri- private uh, private funders. Um, I would say to us, you know, we, we know what we know and we know what we don't know. We're not that smart. We can't decide a new company and whether or not that market is huge. If they've developed a relationship with a, a venture company that, you know, has specific goals and product, product development milestones they need to see before that VC really is interested, that's what we pay for. We don't push out something. We're not that smart. It's a complete pull model. So if you come back to us with a company that says, we really like this company, but they need to do first in human, they need to do prototyping, they need to do regulatory IP, they need to do something that solidifies their position in order for them to be investable. That's the space we live in. And it's a niche. It's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, I'm going to say, uh, pretty easy to do. Um, but again, our check sizes are not great for pharma, even though we have invested in pharma. But you know, it's basically in the digital health med device space and just right once you get your 510k and everything like that everybody's happy. Um, we're prepared to help fund those kinds of activities. So you got to just know what you know. If, 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 if you have you have to drive those relationships, you have to go to those partnering events, you have to be able to get on it. Uh, uh, somebody that wants to write you a big check interested in you, and then we will help you uh, get that relationship on the go. Thank you. Jeff, any Jeff Cohen, any last comment, and then I think we're we're, we're done. You know, so I, I just wanted to circle around, and I'm, I've been thinking and processing about analyzing the signals, such as a couple of you are, are involved with, or or changing the peripheral vasculature where you're able to change and via neuroplasticity train and treat. The, uh, the, the nerves from the brain to the toes to better send a signal or and to do that with various pharmaceuticals. Kind of an open-ended question as far as where we're going and, and anyone jump in, it feels like we're going everywhere, but yet many folks are involved on in one piece of that. Anyone I see Aswin smiling the most. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, you, you summarized it well. It, it is a broad spectrum, but uh, what's the question, Jeff? I, I, I guess how you're thinking about the entire industry transforming over the coming decade as far as the diagnostic piece to the treatment piece to the understanding piece. In one line, it's going to be very data-driven. Uh, the brain's not going to be, it's going to become less and less mysterious. And we're going to have more and more data to inform whether it's a therapeutic uh, uh, development or it's it's a it's a pharma or drug development or even if it's a device development, it's getting it's getting more it's going to be more and more informed by the data itself because we're going to be able to get that information better, and 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 target better and uh, improve efficacy better. And Jeff, Arthur, Nader. Yeah, any, uh... I I just agree with what. I agree with what Aswin's saying. And, and, you know, for us, it's being able to use the diagnostics that we're going to be creating along our our pipeline here and then partnering with pharma so that we could be more effectively used in their phase three studies so that we can much quicker determine the effectiveness of new therapies that are coming out. So that's a, that's ultimately a big opportunity for us that we need to move to not ready yet, but um, there's got to be that partnership happening so that, you know, we, we can tell much, much quicker, um, you know, how effective a therapeutic is using uh, some of the technology we've got coming forward. Got it. Oh, so I think from our perspective, um, we think uh, Ashwin and Jeff was, uh, was absolutely right, um, you know, um, multiple modalities, measuring, um, uh, the, the, the AI for us right now is not the individual data modality. It's not you know, just AEG, not, it's gonna be the combination of those data modalities telling us 
very clinical, uh, the, the, the accurate clinically relevant state of the brain and the nervous system. And then it, you're going to now be able to then have a particular intervention for that specific uh, population that shows these characteristics. You know, neuroscience is where cancer was 10, 15 years ago, where the labels are really hindering how we treat people. And, you know, the data, like everybody says, the data is going to tell you what bucket you fit in and what intervention is going to be required. We're just in the bucket farming stage right now for neurosciences. Yeah, uh, related to that, I'll just say, as the pathophysiology is being elucidated on some of these, these neurological disorders, there are new targets that are emerging. And on the technology side, there are miniaturized uh, uh, approaches that are emerging. So I, I think this is gonna be a very vibrant field for the next 10 to 20 years, because we finally know how these pathways work, what the mechanisms are, and you know what we should be stimulating. So, that's fantastic. And I guess, lastly, for Deanna, for you, you know, being that we're looking at more public companies, we, we generally look at what can you create, and how much time, and what does it cost. And we look at so the you know what's the current accumulated deficit and what will be in three to five years, <clears throat> based on what you can create and what you can do on the commercial front. And I know things are very different on 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 your end, Deanna, being very early stage. How how does one in your seat look at this and get a good feel for TAMs and opportunities and development costs and timelines? We look at the financial return, <laughs> that's so easy. And then when the market are so open, like they used to be until two or three months ago and the valuation are so high, that makes a lot of good comparable for exit to us. And then that's why the industry uh, tends to be more uh, in, in invested. Um, and, um, and then with this, also with this trend on early stage IPO being seen as exit somehow, even even including the lock up at some point, they become an exit. That's also very good for us. So we're, we're strongly influenced by uh, by market conditions because I mean now we're only considering financial return. We're li we're a little bit more. Um, um, <laughs> Uh, sometimes we make some some kind of uh, uh, digression from the major trends because we tend to forget sometimes that yes, the industry on the public markets for this specific sector works on multiple of revenues, um, which is something that uh, we tend sometimes we make the mistake and tend to forget. We tend to believe that there's a therapeutic value that will at some point be recognized. And some companies succeeded actually, some companies succeeded to sort of uh, have the therapeutic va value uh, recognized by public market. I think there should be more education on, on that front. And there um, every, most of, most of the deals become even more interesting, but um, um, yeah, we'll get there. I think there will be more and more companies with very good and solid readouts, positive readouts, um, bringing and trying to get us that therapeutic value and bringing that home for, for the investor interest. Got it. Anyone else on those thoughts? None. Okay. So, um, Deanna, do we have more? No, I think we no, I think we're out of time, and they've been uh, asking us to um, to <laughs> to stop <laughs> for the last five or six minutes. But it was a good conversation. We really enjoyed. I think all of us, I particularly liked, enjoyed the conversation. It was very insightful. So uh, I'm going to thank you, um, each one of the panelists, Jeff as a as co-chair, and the entire SACS organization for arranging this. I hope it was uh, uh, insightful and valuable for, for the audience. Thank you very much. And let's reconvene in more peaceful times, hopefully soon. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye now.